functions now are. Okay, so we did a forward pass after hooking the output of the convolutional section of the model. We grabbed what it stored. We checked the shape. It was 512 by 11 by 11, as we predicted. We then took the mean of the channel axis to get an 11 by 11 tensor. And then, if we look at that, that's our picture. So there's a lot to unpack, right? A lot to unpack. Um, but if you take your time going through these two sections, the convolution kernel section and the heat map section of this notebook, like running those lines of code and changing them around a little bit, um, and remember the most important thing to look at is shape. You might have noticed when I'm showing you these notebooks, I very often print out the shape. And when you look at the shape, you want to be looking at how many axes are there, that's the rank of the tensor, and how many things are there in each axis, and try and think why, right? Try going back to the printout of the summary, try going back to the actual list of the layers, and try and go back and think about the actual picture we drew, and think about what's actually going on. Okay. So that's a lot. Um, of technical content. So what I'm going to do now is switch from technical content to something um, much more important, unless we have some questions first. Okay, because um, in the next lesson, um, in the next lesson we're going to be looking um, um, at generative models, uh, both uh, text um, and image generative models. And generative models are where you can create um, a new piece of text or a new image or a new video or a new sound. And as you probably are aware, this is the area that deep learning has developed the most in in the last 12 months. And we're now at a point where we can generate realistic looking videos, uh, images, um, audio, um, and uh, to some extent even text. And so there are many things in, um, in this journey which have ethical considerations, but perhaps this uh, area of generative modeling is one of the largest ones. So before I got into it, I wanted to specifically touch on um, ethics and data science. Um, most of uh, the stuff I'm showing you actually comes from um, Rachel, and um, uh, Rachel has a really cool uh, uh, TEDx San Francisco talk that you can check out uh, on YouTube, and uh, a more extensive analysis of um, ethical principles and bias principles in AI, which you can find at this talk um, here. And she has a playlist that you can check out. Um, we've already touched on an example of bias, um, which was this gender shades study, where if you remember, um, for example, lighter male skin people on IBM's um, main uh, computer vision system are 99.7% accurate, and darker females are some hundreds of times less accurate in terms of error. Um, so like extraordinary differences. And so it's interesting to kind of like, okay, it's, it's, it's first of all important to be aware that not only can this happen technically, but this can happen on a massive companies rolled out publicly available, highly marketed system that hundreds of quality control people have studied and lots of people are using. Right? It, it, it's, it's out there in the wild. They all look kind of crazy. right? And so it's interesting to think about why. And so one of the reasons why is that the data we feed these things. right? We tend to use, me included, a lot of these data sets kind of unthinkingly, right? But like ImageNet, which is the basis of like a lot of the computer vision stuff we do, is over half American and Great Britain, right? Like when it comes to the countries that actually have most of the population in the world, I can't even see them here. They're somewhere in these, these impossibly thin lines. Because remember, these data sets are being created almost exclusively by people in US, Great Britain, and nowadays increasingly also China. Um, 
So there's a lot of bias in the content we're creating because of a bias in the kind of people that are creating that content, even when, in theory, it's being created in a very kind of neutral way. But you can't argue with the data, right? It, it's, it's obviously not neutral at all. And so when you have biased data creating biased algorithms, you then need to say, like, well, what are we doing with that? So we've been, spent a lot of time talking about image recognition. So a couple of years ago, uh, this company, DeepClint, uh, advertised uh, their image recognition system, which can be used to um, uh, do mass surveillance on large crowds of people. Uh, find uh, any person passing through who is a person of interest, uh, in theory. And so putting aside even the question of, like, is it a good idea to have such a system, you've got to think, is it a good idea to have such a system where certain kinds of people are 300 times more likely to be misidentified? And then thinking about it, so this is now starting to happen in America, right, where these systems are being rolled out. And so there are now systems in America that will identify a person of interest in a video and send a ping to the local police. And so these systems are extremely inaccurate and extremely biased. And what happens then, of course, is if you're in a predominantly black neighborhood where the um, probability of successfully recognizing you is much lower, and you're much more likely to be surrounded by black people, and so suddenly all of these black people are popping up as persons of interest, or in a video of a person of interest, all the people in the video are all recognized as in the vicinity as a person of interest, you suddenly get all these pings going off the local police department, causing the police to run down there, and therefore likely to lead to a larger number of arrests, um, which is then likely to feed back into the data being used to develop the systems. So this is happening right now. And so, like, thankfully, a very small number of people are actually bothering to look into these things. I mean, ridiculously small, but at least it's better than nothing. And so, for example, and one of the best ways that people get publicity is to do kind of funny experiments, like, let's try the uh, mugshot uh, image recognition system that's being widely used and try it against the members of Congress and find out that there are 28 members of Congress who would have been identified by this system, obviously, incorrectly. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, uh, members of, black members of Congress, not at all surprised to hear that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we see this kind of bias in a lot of the systems we use, um, um, not just image recognition, but uh, text translation. When you convert she is a doctor, he is a nurse, into Turkish, you quite correctly get uh, a gender-inspecific pronoun, because that's what Turkish uses. You could then take that and feed it back into Turkish with your gender-inspecific pronoun, and you will now get he is a doctor, she is a nurse. So the bias, again, this is in a massively widely rolled out, carefully studied system. And it's not like even these kind of things, like a little one-off things that then get fixed quickly. These issues have been identified in Google Translate for a very long time, and they're still there, and they don't get fixed. So the, the kind of results of this are, in my opinion, quite terrifying. Um, because what's happening is that in many countries, including America, where I'm speaking from now, um, algorithms are increasingly being used for all kinds of public policy, uh, judicial, and so forth purposes. For example, there's a system called Compass, which is very widely used to decide who's going to jail. And it does that in a couple of ways. It tells judges what sentencing guidelines they should use for particular cases, and it tells um, them also which people uh, the system says uh, should be let out on bail. But here's the thing. White people, it keeps on saying, let this person out, even though they end up reoffending, and vice versa. It's systematically like out by double compared to what it should be in terms of getting it wrong with white people versus black people. So um, this is like 
kind of horrifying because, I mean, amongst other things, the data that it's using in this system is literally asking people questions about things like, um, did any of your parents ever go to jail? Do any of your friends do drugs? Like, they're asking questions about other people who they have no control over. So not only are these systems biased, very systematically biased, um, but they're also being done on the basis of, of data which is totally out of your control. So this is kind of, um, did you want to add something to that? Oh yeah, are your parents divorced is another question that's being used to decide whether you go to jail or not. Right? So when we raise these issues kind of on Twitter or in talks or whatever, there's always a few people, always white men, a few people who will always say like, that's just the way the world is. That's just re re reflecting what the data shows. But when you actually look at it, it's not, right? It's actually systematically erroneous and systematically erroneous against people of color, uh, minorities, the people who are less involved in creating uh, the systems that these products are based on. Sometimes this can go a really long way. So, for example, in Myanmar, there was a genocide of the Rohingya people. And that genocide was very heavily created by Facebook. Not because anybody at Facebook wanted it. I mean, heavens no. I know a lot of people at Facebook. I have a lot of friends at Facebook. They're really trying to do the right thing, right? They're really trying to create a, a product that people like. But not in a thoughtful enough way. Because when you roll out something where literally in Myanmar, a country that most people didn't have, most, maybe half of people didn't have uh, electricity until very recently, and you say, hey, you can all have free internet as long as it's just Facebook, you've got to think carefully about what you're doing, right? And then you use algorithms to feed people the stuff they will click on. And of course, what people click on is stuff which is controversial stuff that makes their blood boil. So when they actually started asking the generals in the Myanmar army that were literally throwing babies onto bonfires, they were saying, we know that these are not humans. We know that they are animals because we read the news. We read the internet, right? And because this is the, 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 this is the stories that the algorithms are pushing. Right? And the algorithms are pushing the stories because the algorithms are good. They know how to create eyeballs, how to get people watching, and how to get people clicking. And again, nobody at Facebook said, let's cause a massive genocide in Myanmar. They said, let's maximize the engagement of people in this new market on our platform. Right? So they very successfully maximized engagement. Yes? Please. It's just it's important to note um, people warned executives at Facebook how the platform was being used to incite violence as far back as 2013, 2014, 2015. In 2015, someone even warned executives that Facebook could be used in Myanmar in the same way that the radio broadcasts were used in Rwanda during the Rwandan genocide. And as of 2015, Facebook only had Four, um, four contractors who spoke Burmese working for them. Um, they really did not put many resources into the issue at all, even though they were getting very, um, very alarming warnings about it. So, I mean, so why does this happen, right? Um, a part of the issue is that ethics is complicated, and you will not find Rachel or I telling you how to do ethics. You know, how, how do you fix this? We don't know. We can just give you kind of things to think about, right? Another part of the problem we keep hearing is, it's not my problem. I'm just a researcher. I'm just a techie. I'm just building a data set. I'm not part of the problem. I'm part of this foundation that's far enough away that I can imagine that I'm not part of this, right? But, you know, if you're creating ImageNet, and you want it to be successful, you want lots of people to use it, you want lots of people to build products on it, lots of people to do research on top of it. If you're trying to create something that people are using, you want them to use, then please try to make it something that won't cause massive amounts of harm. 
and doesn't have massive amounts of bias. And it can actually come back and bite you in the ass, right? The Volkswagen engineer who ended up actually encoding the thing that made them systematically cheat on their diesel emissions tests, on their um, pollution tests, ended up in jail. Not because it was their decision to cheat on the tests, but because their manager told them to write that code, and they wrote the code. And therefore, they were the ones that ended up being criminally responsible, and they were the ones that were jailed. Right? So if you do, in some way, a shitty thing that ends up causing trouble, that can absolutely come back around and get you in trouble as well. Sometimes it can cause huge amounts of trouble. So if we go back to World War II, right, then this was one of the first great opportunities for IBM to show off their amazing, amazing tabulating system. And they had a huge client in Nazi Germany. And Nazi Germany used this amazing new tabulating system to encode all of the different types of Jews that they had in the country and all the different types of problem people. So Jews were eight, gypsies were 12, uh, then different uh, outcomes were coded, uh, executions were a four, death in a gas chamber was six. Um, uh, a Swiss judge uh, ruled that IBM um, was actively involved uh, facilitating the commission of these crimes against humanity. Right? So there are absolutely plenty of examples of people building data processing technology that are directly causing deaths, sometimes millions of deaths. Right? So we don't want to be one of those people. And so you might have thought, oh, you know, I'm just creating some data processing software and somebody else is thinking I'm just a salesperson and somebody else is thinking I'm just the biz dev person opening new markets, but it all comes together, right? So we need to care. And so one of the things we need to care about is getting humans back in the loop, right? And so when we pull humans out of the loop, uh, is one of the first times that trouble happens. I don't know if you remember, I remember this very clearly, when I first heard that Facebook was firing the human editors that were responsible for um, basically curating the news that ended up on the Facebook um, pages. And I've got to say, at the time, I thought, that's a recipe for disaster. Because I've seen again and again that humans can be the person in the loop that can realize this isn't right. You know, it's very hard to create an algorithm that can recognize this isn't right, or else humans are very good at that. And we saw that's what happened, right? After Facebook fired the human editors, the nature of stories on Facebook dramatically changed, right? And you started seeing this proliferation of conspiracy theories, and the kind of the algorithms went crazy with recommending more and more controversial topics. And of course, that changed people's consumption behavior causing them to want more and more um, uh, controversial topics. So where one of the really interesting places this comes in, and uh, Cathy O'Neill, who's got a great book um, called um, Weapons of Math Destruction, thank you, um, Rachel, um, uh, and many others have pointed out, is that um, what happens to algorithms is that they end up uh, impacting people. For example, Compass sentencing guidelines go to a judge. Now, you can say the algorithm's very good. We, I mean, in Compass's case, it isn't. It actually turned out to be about as bad as random um, because it's a black box and all that. Um, but even if it was very good, uh, you could then say, well, you know, the judge is getting the algorithm. Uh, otherwise, they'd just be getting a person. People also give bad advice. So what? Humans respond differently to algorithms. It's very common, particularly for a human that is not very familiar with the technology themselves, like a judge, to see like, oh, that's what the computer says. The computer looked it up and it figured this out. Right? It's extremely difficult to get a non-technical audience to look at a computer recommendation and come up with a nuanced decision-making process. So, what we see is that algorithms are often put into place with no appeals process. They're often used to massively scale up decision-making systems because they're cheap. 
And then the people that are using the outputs of those algorithms tend to give them more credence than they deserve because very often they're being used by people that don't have the technical competence to judge them themselves. So a great example, right, was here's an example of somebody who lost their health care. And they lost their health care because of an error in a new algorithm that was systematically failing to recognize that there are um, many people that need help with, was it Alzheimer's? Cerebral palsy and diabetes. Thanks, Rachel. And so this system, which had this, this error that was later discovered, was cutting off these people from the home care that they needed so that cerebral palsy victims no longer had the care they needed. So their life was destroyed, basically. And so when the person that created that algorithm with the error was asked about this and was specifically said, should they have found a better way to communicate the system, the strengths, the failures, and so forth, he said, yeah, I should probably also dust under my bed. That was there. That was the level of interest they had. And this is extremely common. I hear this all the time. And it's much easier to kind of see it from afar and say, okay, after the problem's happened, I can see that that's a really shitty thing to say. But it can be very difficult when you're kind of in the middle of it. I just want to say one more thing about that example. Um, and that's that this was a case where it was separate. There was someone who created the algorithm. Then I think different people implemented the software. And this is in, in use in over half of the 50 states. And then there was also the particular policy decisions made by that state. And so there, this is one of those situations where nobody felt responsible because the algorithm creator is like, oh, no, it's the policy decisions of the state that were bad. you know. And the state can be like, oh, no, it's the ones who implemented the software. Um, and so everyone's just kind of pointing fingers and not taking responsibility. Responsibility. And, you know, in some ways maybe it's unfair, but I would argue the person who is creating the data set and the person who is implementing the algorithm is the person best placed to get out there and say, hey, here are the things you need to be careful of and make sure that they're a part of the implementation process. So we've also seen this with YouTube, right? It's kind of similar to what happened with Facebook. And we're now seeing, we've heard examples of students watching the Fast AI courses who say, hey, Jeremy and Rachel, watching the Fast AI courses, really enjoyed them. And at the end of one of them, the YouTube autoplay fed me across to a conspiracy theory. And what happens is that once the system decides that you like the conspiracy theories, it's going to just feed you more and more. And then what happens is that, yeah, please, go on. Just uh, briefly, you don't, you don't even have to like conspiracy theories. The goal is to get as many people hooked on conspiracy theories as possible, is what the algorithm is trying to do, um, kind of whether or not you've expressed interest. Right. And so the interesting thing, again, is I, I know plenty of people involved in YouTube recommendation systems. None of them are wanting to promote conspiracy theories. But people click on them, right? And people share them. And what tends to happen is also people that um, are into conspiracy theories consume a lot more YouTube media. So it actually is very good at finding a market that watches a lot of hours of YouTube. And then it makes that market watch even more. So this is an example of a feedback loop. And uh, the New York Times has ne is now describing YouTube as perhaps the most powerful radicalizing instrument of the 21st century. Now I can tell you, my friends that worked on the YouTube recommendation system did not think they were creating the most powerful radicalizing instrument of the 21st century. And to be honest, most of them today, when I talk to them, still think they're not. They think it's all bullshit. You know, not all of them. But a lot of them now are at the point where they just feel like they're the victims here. People are unfairly, you know, they don't get it. They don't understand what we're trying to do. Uh, it's very, very difficult when you're right out there in the heart of it. So you've got to be thinking from right at the start, what are the possible unintended consequences of what you're working on? And as the technical people involved, how can you get out in front and make sure that people are aware of them? And I just also wanted to say that in particular, many of these conspiracy theories are promoting white supremacy. They're, um, you know, kind of far-right ethno-nationalism, anti-science, and I think, I don't know, 
maybe five or 10 years ago, I would have thought conspiracy theories are more, a more fringe thing, but we're seeing the kind of huge societal impact it can have for many people to, to believe these. Yeah, and you know, partly it's you see them on YouTube all the time, it starts to feel a lot more normal, right? So one of the things that people are doing um, to try to say like how to fix this problem is to explicitly get involved in talking to the people who might or will be impacted by the kind of decision-making processes that you're enabling. So for example, there was a really cool thing um, recently where literally um, statisticians and data scientists got together with um, people who had been um, inside the criminal system, i.e. had gone through the, the bail and sentencing process of criminals themselves, and talking to the lawyers who worked with them, and put them together with the data scientists, and actually kind of put together a timeline of how exactly does it work, and where exactly are the places that there are inputs, and how do people respond to them, and who's involved. This is really cool, right? This is the only way for you, as a kind of a data product developer, to actually know how your data product's going to be working. A really great example of, a, of somebody who did a great job here was Evan Estola at Meetup, who said, hey, a lot of men are going to our tech meetups, and if we use a recommendation system naively, it's going to recommend more tech meetups to men, which is going to cause more men to go to them, and then when women do try to go, they'll be like, oh my god, there's so many men here, which is going to cause more men to go to the tech meetups, yeah, yeah, so showing recommendations to men and therefore not showing them to women. Yes, yeah. Um, so, so what um, uh, Evan and Meetup decided was to make an explicit product decision that this would not even be representing the actual true preferences of people. It would be creating a runaway feedback loop. So let's explicitly stop it, right, before it happens and, and not uh, uh, recommend less meetups to women and uh, tech meetups to women and more tech meetups to men. And so I think that's, that's just, it's, it's really cool. It's like it's saying we don't have to be slaves to the algorithm, we actually get to decide. Another thing that uh, people can do to help is um, regulation. And normally when we kind of talk about regulation, there's a natural reaction of like, how do you regulate these things? It's ridiculous, you can't regulate AI. But actually when you look at it, Again and again, and this fantastic um, uh, paper called Data Sheets for Data Sets um, has lots of examples of this. There are many, many examples of industries where people thought they couldn't be regulated, people thought that's just how it was, like cars. People died in cars all the time because they literally had sharp metal knobs on dashboards, steering columns weren't collapsible, uh, and all of the discussion in the community was that's just how cars are, and when people die in cars, it's because of the people. But then eventually the regulations did come in. And today, driving is dramatically safer, like dozens and dozens of times safer than it was before. Right? So often there are things we can do through policy. So to summarize, we are part of the 0 0.3 to 0.5% of the world that knows how to code. Right? We, we have a skill that very few other people do. Not only that, we now know how to code deep learning algorithms, which is like the most powerful kind of code I know. Right? So I, I'm hoping that we can explicitly think about like at least not making the world worse and perhaps explicitly making it better. Right? And so why is this interesting to you as an audience in particular? And that's because fast AI in particular is trying to make it easy for domain experts to use deep learning. And so this picture of the goats here is an example of one of our um, international fellows from a previous course who was a, a, a goat dairy farmer and told us that uh, they were going to uh, use deep learning on their remote Canadian island to help study udder disease in goats. Now, and to me this is a great example of like a domain experts problem which nobody else even knows about, let alone know that it's a computer vision problem that can be solved with deep learning. So, in, in your field, whatever it is, you probably know a lot more now about the opportunities in your field to make it a hell of a lot better than it was before. You'll probably be able to come up with all kinds of cool product ideas, right? Maybe build a startup or create a new product group in your company or whatever. But also, please be thinking about what that's going to mean in practice and think about where can you put humans in the loop? 
right? Where can you put those pressure release valves? Who are the people you can talk to who could be impacted, who could help you understand, right? And get the kind of humanities folks involved who understand history and psychology and sociology and so forth. So that's our plea to you. If you've got this far, you're definitely at a point now where you're ready to, you know, make a serious impact on the world. So um, I hope we can make sure that that's a positive impact. See you next week.